So tonight we have Yanir Baryam with us uh, for the VetCov 60 Minutes. Uh, Dr. Baryam is an American scientist specializing in complex systems. Uh, he has an extremely impressive scientific record in addition to the work he's doing with pandemics. Dr. Baryam is the founding president of, a, of an organization called New England Complex Systems Institute. Uh, this is an, an a independent research institution that studies complex systems, and I'd say the pandemic would qualify. Uh, and it studies the science of this and the real-world application. Uh, Yanir is an expert in the quantitative analysis of pandemics. He's advised policymakers on the Western, Af Western African Ebola virus epidemic a few years back. He founded ncoronavirus.org, a global, global network of over 4,000 volunteers uh, in February 2020, and I think it's a lot larger now, uh, to provide information, guidelines, and policy advocacy to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. He's also an activist working to bring change on how we handle pandemics, especially now. And, and he's been working tirelessly all year for this. So we have him here tonight with us to answer some of your questions. And uh, as we go along, I will start first with questions that have been sent to us in advance. Uh, I apologize up front if I miss any of your questions. We will we'll see how much time we have to get through them. I've tried to organize them. And, but you can also chat in questions during the conversation. Uh, and so the, and this, the questions have been translated from Swedish to English, so I can see both. Uh, but of course, Yanir is going to answer in English. Uh, so I'm going to start off, Yanir, with a, with a pretty tough question, I think. Uh, and this question is, is one about this CNN feature on June 8th. Uh, where Dr. Luang of the University of HK and C. Bennett, uh, epidemiologist at Deakin University, commented, and this is commented that they think there are negative consequences with zero COVID. And this question comes from Elizabeth Wall in our group, and she said it, that the, the feature mentions, for example, that the strict border controls in combination with strict quarantine rules are not sustainable in the long term. They talk about the challenge of reuniting the, with the rest of the world, e.g. Australia's borders will be closed for another year. How do you respond to these arguments? So the question really, um, you know, if we are thinking about consequences, then we have to uh, uh, understand what the comprehensive set of consequences are. In the meantime, people across the countries who have not done zero COVID have suffered from the challenges of the day-to-day -day life in their own neighborhoods with their local communities and um, have not had the opportunity to do most of the normal activities or many of the normal activities that we attribute with a lifestyle that is fulfilling. And there have been tremendous claims about the pressures that the resulting social restriction causes for people. And what we see in, uh, by contrast to this is the lifestyle of people in countries that have achieved elimination, achieved zero COVID. And that includes Australia and New Zealand, but also China. Um, and, and in those countries, they, are, they don't notice that the pandemic is around and they're, you know, from time to time, we hear about how people are amazed at the rest of the world is still struggling with this disease. If there are, are, are consequences to the you know, long range travel restrictions, um, surely uh, the people who are enjoying those conditions are, uh, are reporting a much better lifestyle and conditions than are being reported in countries that have not achieved it. And if we project into the future, uh, what we uh, talk about in the future is speculative, right? People who are scientists often come up with ideas about what might be present under different circumstances or other contexts. It's really important to distinguish speculative statements from scientific observations and understanding of the world that is um, uh, solid. Um, and unfortunately, 
the fact that scientists are prone to speculative statements has become part of the narrative of this outbreak. We really should be distinguishing the un scientific understanding from speculations that scientists like to make about what might happen or could happen in the future. And in this regard, in the meantime, the, the statements that have been made in speculative uh, uh, discussions, uh, in particular, and we know this about Sweden, about speculative discussions about what would happen uh, in the futures dating from the early times of the outbreak in Sweden, about the claims that there would be massive numbers of deaths and even more deaths in places that fought the disease, that hasn't materialized. And in fact, those countries that have a zero COVID uh, policy uh, have a hundred times or more or less deaths than the countries that have um, uh, decided to live with the virus. So what we see are countries that have failed to control the virus, have experienced systematically poor health, systematically poor economic conditions, and systematically poor life conditions. And anything else that is being said is not what we observe. And speculations about the future remain just that, speculations which should be dismissed based upon observations uh, of what we see. Well, based on your observations, I'm going to come back because some of the questions ask you to speculate about the future. So we'll see how that works out. But, but I, I, I also, I mean, I just want to pipe in because I have relatives in Vietnam, which is struggling a little bit now because the, yeah. the, uh, the Delta or the Indian combination, the Alpha Delta mutant, co-mutant is there now, the Indian UK mutant, and they've shut down parts of it very quickly, uh, which they did before, and they've remarkably handled this. And, and my relatives are super happy about how they've handled it, okay, first of all, I'll say. But, I mean, I have pointed out uh, uh, in, in several media that, that it's the West that is the poison. If we had all done what Vietnam did, my relatives wouldn't have to be worried about this. We would all be basically rid of this. But we have such a high infection in the rest of the world. So I think I want to turn the question around. On when, if someone asks me this question, I turn around and say it's not there. It's not there. But yes, it's hard for them, but it's hard because of us. That's right. So, yeah. and that's super true. And, and and then we see other countries. You know, we're talking. You mentioned India and India. You know, relaxed restrictions, which, you know, people are, you know, saying, hey, you know, we have to relax restrictions. They ended up with 400,000 cases per day and then they shut down and they dramatically reduced cases now. And there are states there. There's a state with our Pradesh that is now um, implementing what we have advocated, which is a green zone strategy. And they have cases down by basically a factor of 50 or so from um, what they had at peak. Uh, so in a, in a population of 200 million people, it's the largest subnational entity in the world. They have about 700 uh, cases per day at this point. Um, and, and so they're on track uh, and the reason on track to achieve elimination. But the reason that they're on track is not just because they're achieving a decline in cases, but because they're implementing a strategy where each village is given a reward for achieving elimination. They have a policy called uh, my village, no, co yeah. you know, Corona free. And, and so the villages are, you know, as of a week and a half ago, like two thirds of the villages were Corona free. Um, if we look at Israel now, that has a policy of severe travel restrictions, which is one of the things that we're talking about, right? But also, they keep kept masks, they still have masks, they, they did have, they have high vaccination rates, but they had a vaccine uh, passport thing so that only people in stores could, were the ones with vaccines. And they had a policy which insisted on a decreasing number of cases, so R less than one. They're now at the threshold of elimination. They have five cases, sorry, they have a half case per million, five cases per day in a country of 10 million people, right? So, so we're talking about half a case per million uh, uh, in the population. And, wow. and that's at the threshold at which the contact tracing can stop outbreak. And they've had a couple of days 
one day without cases, another couple of days with two cases. And within a couple of weeks, if they uh, you know, stick to this, um, they may get to elimination. And yeah. once they get to elimination, they will then have a choice whether to keep their borders controlled or to allow new cases in to have another outbreak. I think there's a tremendous incentive for people who want to live a positive life to stop cases from coming into the country. And that's why we see the countries of Australia and New Zealand not giving up on their border control, but doubling down and making sure that they don't uh, allow uh, a runaway uh, infection to occur. Yeah, and we could discuss this all night, but we'll we'll run out of time if I do that because <laughs> I have other things. But uh, Elizabeth Wall asked the question, it seems that zero COVID strategy has currently been most successful in Asian countries and in Australia and New Zealand. And uh, and and so this follows on this line of discussion. And, and are there cultural explanations, geographical, the political, uh, the politics, which uh, the political will has existed uh, uh, or is it something else or any other explanation? What do you think? Well, you know, Atlantic Canada, which is four provinces, the eastern part of Canada, and yeah, Iceland has also achieved elimination. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think from what I understand, Iceland shares a cultural heritage with Sweden and other uh, yeah. Scandinavian countries. Technically. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I don't I don't see that uh, statement and to claim that Australia and New Zealand are somehow culturally the same as China or uh, Vietnam doesn't really make sense. Um, I, I think that, you know, or take Mongolia or other countries that have really uh, effectively suppressed the outbreak. And, and what we see is that there is no unifying pattern to the countries that have been successful, the regions that have been successful at elimination. There is a distinction in the will of political leaders. There is no doubt about it that the values that political leaders espouse is directly linked to the success in, in stopping the outbreak. And, and that has to do with the idea of protecting the population, compassion, and yeah. um, and following the science. So uh, the, the compassion itself is a tremendous driver of success. The desire to prevent transmission, to prevent sickness, to prevent illness and death uh, is a tremendous motivation for, for, for stopping the outbreak. And then the science shows the way, the science shows the choice. If you ask the question, and we've had a tremendous difficulty in the West because of the lack of experience with pandemics, right? So in the Far East, the main reason that one would point to for the success, in addition to compassion where it's expressed is the experience with SARS. People who had experience with SARS were able to react much better. And even the difference between an administration that knew about it and an administration that didn't know about it, we see a tremendous difference. It's the ability to recognize that elimination is possible. SARS was eliminated, it was stopped. It was, it's a respiratory disease, it's the most similar disease to the coronavirus. And yet we have a, an incredible number of Western supposed experts in pandemics, but they're really just experts in human disease and in, in endemic disease. And so when they look at any disease, they see what they have been studying. They see the flu, which was the worst disease that people were studying. They studied it in college. And, 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 and with that in mind, they interpret what's going on with the coronavirus. And yeah. as when you talk to people who are familiar with diseases in Africa, we've and you know we've we've confined many diseases to uh, certain parts of the world. And polio was just eliminated from the Philippines again after a struggle of a number of years. Why is it possible? And the answer is, it's possible because of determined and concerted action. It's not easy. It's never something that can be taken for granted. 
Um, but it's something that we can do if we set our minds to it. And this passive acceptance, the passivity, is super important, recognizing that epidemiologists do not study human action. Epidemiologists do not study leadership in the context of social response. Um, and what we need in the context of an outbreak is the combination of understanding of disease and understanding of social response and the opportunity that we have to achieve elimination, to go to zero COVID requires both. And recognizing that a leader with, uh, with uh, compassion and with uh, an understanding that people will act if they're given the knowledge about what are the consequences um, uh, is the leader that will lead to positive outcomes. There's a, just to, to say this, people are capable of incredible things when they do things together. And there is a tremendous narrative about the, you know, the can't do, right? So we can't do this, we can't do that. And somehow, instead of responding to China's success in eliminating the coronavirus and saying, you know, if China can do it, we can do it there was this, if China does it, that means we can't do it. Yeah, a yeah. Tremendous <laughs> self undermining. Uh, and, and it's very counter to, you know, say US traditional culture of a can do society. And it's surely very counter to Sweden's image of a compassionate society. Um, and, uh, and, and we've, failed to live up to our own ideals of ourselves. And, and I think one of the main challenges in this year and in upcoming years will be to restore not only our self image, but our ability to act in view of our own values, uh, the values that we uh, uh, hold deep. And, you, may, you want to say something, but this is really a crux of, of what has been uh, the uh, failure yeah. of the Western world. It really has. And I think the values need to be looked at as well. I mean, I think a big difference between the Eastern side and the Western side of the world is that the, this is, is thinking as a collective versus thinking as individuals. And, uh, and Sweden is, despite the image, Sweden has turned out to be a very individualistic thinking country which surprised me living here. So yeah. that's, I, I, I won't say too much more, but it's, but it's, it's but I think it's important. <laughs> the, the point is that we say that it's individualistic, but we know that when there are calls for shared action, they do happen. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I do think that a lot of this is less about the people and more about the narratives that have been uh, propagated. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's perhaps, I mean, and if you propagate narratives that people want to hear, they will always go with it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, it's give them the easy way out and they think that anyway. Yeah. That's but very... by the way, the polls have shown, I mean, polls in multiple countries, right? You know, there's all of this narrative about the conflict between parties and ideologies in the U S for example, but the polls consistently show during the, you know, many months, of last year, I haven't looked at them last few months, but for many months that there was a, you know, a large majority, like 80% or more of people who wanted to do more in order to stop the pandemic. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I don't know if that's true here, but I, I don't think people are following. I think people are, many people here, I, I think looking at the polls here are, are more or less sort of, <clears throat> Assuming the government will take it, take care of it, and don't want to get themselves involved, and so they really don't see it. So the polls are misleading. I, again, I think that the, the there is a tremendous influence of the narrative in the press. We know this. Yeah. Well, let me. Yeah, of course, and that, that's yeah. This has been a huge battle in Sweden. The the, the whole thing, exactly, and what you're saying. Uh, I have a, this is a sort of three part question. Okay, uh, but Patricia. 
Sahlström asks, what do you think today about Sweden's non-strategy? So this is sort of the broad question that you knew would come up. And Osberg Oya, I hope I said your name right, <laughs> says, first, Janir Barjam is one of my main role models, which is a big compliment in Sweden, and, and then says, what should Sweden do now? So, so it's a loaded question. So, um, first of all, it is important to realize that non-strategies are strategies, right? Not to decide is to decide. And what we found is that in the pandemic context, there really is, you know, any choice except for a determined intentional aiming for zero leads to the same terrible outcomes. Yeah. Right. So the point is that there is this, if we decide to go to zero and we do it intentionally, we will get, we will get through the exit and it will be gone. And if we don't, we'll be caught in this looping miasma of increasing cases and decreasing cases and so on. Now what's happened now is that there has been a new opportunity that's been created and that's because of the vaccines. The vaccines are an incredibly powerful tool for stopping transmission and they enable us to have an easier time of achieving elimination. But we still have yeah. to decide to do it. Yeah. When we look across Europe, we see many countries that have dramatic reductions in the number of cases. And they're much lower in number of cases than in previous, quote, waves. The peaks and the valleys, the valleys are still quite high in recent months. Um, but if you look at the recent times, the, there's been tremendous reduction in number of cases. And the reason is because there's been a combination. Take, you can take, for example, Poland or Czechia or other countries. There's been a tremendous reduction of cases down far below what the reduction of cases were in previous waves. And the reason is twofold. Number one, um, there's been an greater intent of doing stronger action, stronger lockdowns. There's soft lockdowns were hardened a little bit. And part of the reason for this was the variants. The variants were creating new challenge in stopping transmission. And the second thing is that the vaccination was ramped up. And eventually, despite early slow uh, introductions of vac vaccination, it ramped up quite uh, effectively. And then now we have say tens of percents of vaccines, uh, uh, vaccination uh, and significant restrictions. And as a result, the cases dramatically decreased. Yeah. With that dramatic decrease, achieving elimination is in with, within reach. And again, the strategy for doing this is not necessarily all at once, all across Europe, though it could be if people decided to do that but rather is to achieve local elimination and to expand progressively the areas of elimination. And this can be done within countries. It can be done of countries and more countries. And, and, and that's the, the, the way to achieve it because it breaks it up into a divide and conquer strategy. So, so the, sweet, the answer for Sweden as has been the answer for all of the pandemic is, being, is to adopt intentionality about the desire to achieve an outcome, to aim for elimination and to get there. And, and Sweden can do it like other countries. It's a question of decision. Um, but the main thing is to realize that it's not as hard. We don't have to adopt severe restrictions. In Israel, where they've gone down tremendously, they relaxed restrictions early in a way that I was very unhappy with. But as the vaccines ramped up, the vaccines plus the restrictions in place were able to achieve a dramatic reduction in cases. But the key thing is that they didn't relax the restrictions only after the cases were going down rapidly enough and they kept the cases going down. And that enables one to get to an elimination outcome. And the fact that Europe as a whole has many few cases than there were before, again, means that if one achieves elimination 
the likelihood of importing new cases is much lower. Yeah. The stringency of travel restrictions, the restrictions that are need to be put in place are not as great. So it's easier now, let's take advantage of it. The alternative, which unfortunately may very well happen is to allow the Indian variant into Europe. The growth of the Indian variant is partially undermining the vaccines. It is a more rapidly transmitting variant. So it's 2.5 times the transmission of the original, original virus. And that means that the vaccination threshold that what one would need is much higher instead of the 70% people talk about it, it's 90%. Um, and even that, of course, is not the right measure. The, but the point is that combining the vaccine, preventing the variants, we can easily get rid of the virus. If we don't prevent the variants, it again makes it much harder. It again becomes an issue of, of how, um, pers how uh, much will do we have to get to elimination. So we've got it easier now let's take advantage of it and stop this thing and, and get out of the exit from this pandemic. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I, there's several questions popping in as we, as you're speaking related to the Delta virus, the Indian virus. And, um, and uh, I mean, one Michaela Johansson asks if you think Sweden will be able to reconsider and be more active after summer, if the Delta is starting to, spread more broadly. It's in, I think, 11 regions now or something. I forget the exact number. Uh, will, or will they lose face now by starting more broad testing and quarantine? Uh, so, so Sweden, Sweden uh, at some point was compelled to take stronger action than they had expected. They yeah. did have to change policies. Whether they acknowledged completely the change of policy or not is, is, is a separate question. Yeah. Uh, I do think that there is a um, really imperative for everyone to realize that each individual has an opportunity to make an important contribution in this context. The decisions that are being made by everyone really do depend on everyone. And, and so if, if people make decisions, if groups of people make decisions and, and you know, this is a part of our effort globally. We have teams and, and, um, and uh, there has been a growing movement across Europe to inform politicians that the strategies that have been used have failed. If we look at the number of deaths, if we look at the severe illness, if we look at the long COVID effects of this disease, the existing strategies have failed. And, with all that people are, you know, trusting in their government, there's a huge amount of anger. There is a huge amount of anger that underlies how people are relating to what's going on. And that anger is beginning to be expressed. And I do it, I hope that people will find a way to constructively channel the anger and frustration at policymakers into a constructive engagement with making sure that decisions are improved. We have lost the social compact, the ability of government to represent the benefit of the people is not present. And we can argue whether this is because of the science or whether this is because of financial, you know, business interests pushing to open up. There is a cacophony of voices uh, in many uh, different uh, ways what we need now is a concerted uh, action by people who are aware that there's been a failure and by um, those who can communicate clearly about the losses that have been suffered in opposition to this um, widespread statement that, hey, the disease is not severe, it's not harmful, um, you know, we should just you know, accept the losses. This is not the case. These are preventable deaths. They're preventable disease. It's preventable long-term consequences. And the fact that they're preventable and the fact that we care about others, we care about parents, we care about loved ones, we care about children, um, we, we really uh, can um, uh, bring together 
uh, the people who recognize that this has been a terrible um, uh, performance of the social uh, institutions, including government, um, and, and, and move forward towards better decision making and, and get rid of this disease. Now, I, in the middle of that, Anne Carlin wrote and said, Yenir, please come to Sweden and help us. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm happy to participate, participate now, participate over time. Yeah. Um, we are, uh, we share a global uh, mission. It's not in one country, it's not in one continent. Uh, uh, this is something that we all need to do together. And I'm happy to participate uh, in the effort in Sweden. Yeah, and I have to say, Yenir is all over the place. So he's helping, trying to help people everywhere. Mikael Bergren, Bygren says, Sweden removed the recommendation to wear masks in, in indoor environments June 1st when the, curves were, when the curve was pointing downwards. Was that a good idea? So we have to realize that Going down is not the goal. And we have to realize that everything that we do changes the direction of number of cases. Yeah. It's like yeah. the fact that it's going down doesn't make it an extrinsic property of the system. It, it's part of what we do. What we do makes it happen. So uh, if we change masking, then we change what it will do. And if we realize that our goal is to as quickly as possible achieve a dramatic reduction in cases and indeed to achieve elimination, then what we want to do is to maintain restrictions so that we accomplish that goal. It's this, you know, hey, it's okay today, so we don't have to do what we don't want to do. It's just not a good policy in the context of a dynamic process that depends upon what we do. It's like saying, um, you know, um, uh, it's like driving a car and saying, okay, the car is now turning to the right so I can, I can let go of the steering wheel. Or, you know, I've pushed on the brake, the car is now slowing, the, there's a wall in front of me, the car is now slowing, okay, I don't have to push on the brake anymore. <laughs> you know, it, it's the, the, the yeah. mentality of, of this, uh, of the policy direction uh, is, is based upon um, sort of this idea that it's easiest to do nothing. And that's not the case. The yeah. best thing is to do a lot and to get out of this and then to do what we want to do. And the harm that has been, right? I mean, really, the degree of harm that has been done by passivity is just unbelievable. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, we, we've, we're going down slower than the rest of Europe as we did last year. And uh, in the Time article that we had in October, the editors asked us to consider quoting this reference where they looked at 18 countries and, and how they had come down with their mitigation, okay, with their NPIs. And uh, the U.S. and Sweden were considered a class of two that were coming down very slow, and it looks like we're doing the same this year. Yeah, well, the U.S. And, has also done this, you know, victory lap while the, you know, yeah. the Indian, the Delta variant uh, is starting to grow and the you know the cases are beginning to grow in several states in the US and and really the question is what are what are countries going to do next um, it's really good obviously we're really happy that cases are going down we're really happy that we have the vaccines but it's it's not about uh, halfway solutions this virus is, the, is, is very rapidly spreading, which means that either it's going down rapidly or it's going up rapidly. Staying at sort of neutral doesn't, doesn't happen. Uh, and so, you know, if we don't take, pay attention and you know, let, let's say there's this dividing line. There's this dividing line between behaviors that get us out of this and behaviors that keep us in this yo-yo mess that we've been in for the last year and a half. Um, we need to get to the other side of that line. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> let me let me just, uh, I have a loaded question here in, a, in just a minute, but I, I need to stop up. This is about halfway through and just uh, and point out 
that uh, I want to thank everybody in the audience who has uh, donated to support the the, the channel. Okay, and uh, and um, thank you because you keep this going. Okay, and uh, if you want to donate, and if anyone in the audience wants to donate, there's a swish number at the bottom of the screen. It's also in the chat. Uh, it's also on our web page. I want to focus and emphasize that we scientists have, in fact, donated to actually uh, some of us a lot, okay? <laughs> and uh, and Yanir has helped us out too. So you know we don't get any money to ourselves, but actually we join you in donating to keep this channel going. We need the money for technical support. We all everything else we do is volunteer. And as I say, I want to thank Yanir for supporting VetCog as well. And uh, and I mean this is really important. Uh, uh, keep in mind, this is certainly a much better investment than FHM's 1.8 million to make a podcast. Okay, <laughs> which has been going around. It's been in the news, news recently that they spent 1.8 million crowns to make a podcast. Okay, let, now let me go back to a loaded question. Now that I've done my duty on on asking for money, you know, as an, as an ac academic, I was told when I first started that you shake hands, kiss babies, and ask for money. And nowadays, with the pandemic, we don't shake hands so much, so we just kiss babies and ask for money. And so let's talk a little bit about uh, children, okay? Question from Christian Bergquist, Bergquist is, if we don't vaccinate the children, what will happen? So first of all, children are, there's been this terrible mis- a representation of what happens with children. Let's just be clear about it. Um, children are um, often asymptomatic, much more than adults. And part of that may be because they don't know to report their symptoms if they're younger children. But more generally, we uh, understand that children are less symptomatic in their cases. But they, and, and then we know that the outcomes for children in terms of uh, fatalities are, are less than older adults and elderly, but children do have severe cases. And it, it, there is fewer severe cases among children, but the proportion of severe cases of children to adults is much, um, is, is not nearly as small as the fatalities. And then there are the, the other thing is that children do suffer, as adults do, from long-term consequences from long COVID. And the percentage of long COVID is, um, uh, depends upon what measure you use. So if we look at uh, severe symptoms, it's maybe 10 to 20%. If we look at milder symptoms, it's maybe 20 to 40%. And if we look at organ damage, um, it, it's even higher. It's probably over, well over 50% in terms of incidence in those who have cases and even those who have mild or asymptomatic cases. And when we're talking about children suffering long-term consequences, we should be very, very concerned because the, the long lives that children have mean, or we hope they will have, mean that the presence of a severe or even a moderate levels of disability uh, will create tremendous uh, difficulties for them, for their families, uh, and for the society. So children are suffer terribly from coronavirus, and we should be protecting them. And it's important also to remember and to know that with the new variants, children are more severely affected uh, than they were with the original variant both in terms of severity of cases and deaths, and uh, we don't know, but long COVID consequences uh, have already been so high with the original variant that we don't expect them to be less severe uh, for the new variants. So with all of that, and the fact that children are not yet being vaccinated, uh, we have a situation that if we decide to open up or if we decide to relax restrictions and don't protect children, the children will suffer the primary consequences of the relaxation of restrictions because the adults uh, who have been vaccinated will have less likelihood of, of, of cases, whereas the children in proportion 
will have higher likelihood of cases. And this is in fact what we're seeing in the UK. In the UK yeah. with the Delta variant, uh, we see that there are people who are vaccinated continue to have cases, right? The, the point is that vaccines are not preventing cases entirely. They're reducing the chance of being infected by about a factor of 10. Uh, and in reducing the chances by a factor of 10, adults are still being infected, but children are bearing the brunt in the, uh, the majority of cases. We just got a report of, of cases in the UK are among children. And that's because yeah. schools were opened, masks were uh, stopped being used in schools, which we very much objected to. Um, and uh, we have a situation of the children really suffering uh, from uh, more cases uh, and the long, the short term and long term consequences of this are, un, you know, it's unconscionable that this is being done. So we, we, we should, the society should, everyone should recognize that children should be protected and we should revert to a much more basic imperative. And the basic imperative is that children, when they get sick, they suffer and they suffer from this disease, we should protect them. And of course, we should protect their parents uh, and we should protect uh, everyone uh, else uh, from the consequences of this disease. To, to Michaela Johansson, I think half your question is to me, and I don't think there are any actions being taken in schools at the national level here. Uh, but, but she asks for you, Yanira, what's the most important thing to, or what are the most important things to consider when all our unvaccinated kids go back to school in the fall? You know, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, and I know that it's very hard. There should be broad civil disobedience against any risk taking on the part of children. Um, there is no justification for putting children at risk, for putting any child at risk. Um, we know what uh, long COVID is. If anybody doesn't know about it, they can look it up. Um, there's a tremendous suffering going on around the world. The people who have it are very clear. They're coming to us and saying, um, we want to make sure that other people don't suffer from this. Um, I think that we should recognize that um, there is a, um, the, the ignoring of that voice is you know, totally inappropriate. We need to uh, give voice to the people who are suffering. Of course, we also need to give voice to the many people who have died from this terrible disease and, and make sure that that is heard so that others know to avoid the consequences, right? If you only listen to the people who are uh, doing well if you have selective attention, uh, you think that everything is okay. Uh, it is not okay. And the best way to recognize this is to reach out if you are, if you are not, if you don't have friends, immediate friends or family members who are suffering, make sure you ask around. I think you will discover that there are a lot of people who are suffering uh, and, and, um, and that word has to be uh, broadcast uh, much more consistently uh, in the press, uh, which is the channel of communication. But more importantly, and this is super important to, to recognize, through the social network. It is the social network, the communication among friends and family, that is the most important network to overcome the disinformation and misinformation that is being spread in the press. Yeah, Lisa Myler just wrote and said, the new discussion here is that long COVID is psychosomatic. Parents are making their kids think they're sick and media writing about it makes people think they have it. And uh, this- This again is one of these comments. disinformation crazy things. We've, we've seen yeah. tremendous, you know, the, the problem is that medicine in general deals best with acute disease. When you're just about to die and they race in and they, you know, uh, give you, you know, prevent your heart attack or, or prevent your heart attack from being fatal, it's easy to see what medicine is doing. Um, but we have developed the ability to study 
the conditions of people who have long COVID. Um, the symptoms are severe uh, and um, the ability to, to uh, compare the symptoms that are observed and the biological harm, the biological harm to the brain, to the heart, to the organs, um, there is uh, to the lungs. Uh, we have the data, ignore the misinformation and, and, and let's get the word out. And the way to get the word out is to make sure that people understand that it is, yeah. you know, it's, it's interesting there. Nasreen Alwan, who's a physician in the UK, has long COVID. And one of the things that was very clear that when it was a physician saying that she was experiencing long COVID, it had a lot yeah. more weight than when somebody who was doesn't have those credentials were saying it. We need to get, make sure that those voices are heard so that everyone understands what's going on. Yeah, no, I have actually communicated regularly with a number of physicians here who have uh, long COVID, and it's it's uh, and and there are so many studies that show the effects on the heart and the brain now, and I probably have collected about a third of them, and they fill several pages just the, the just the sites, just the uh, links. Uh, but let me let me say, uh, Marie Cook says, uh, please share this episode of 60 Minutes with with our Prime Minister. <laughs> so I thought you'd you'd like that. Uh, let me ask you a more serious question that's a hard one. You were talking about speculation about the future, and I promised you I'd come up with this. Karen Lewis asks, will we be able to get all the escape mutants under control by 2023-24? Will we win the virus variant battle by 2023-24? Uh, this she said, when Friends and Science magazine group originally predicted that the pandemic would be under control, right at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, March, April 20, with their SARS COVID virus simulation, uh, which she's always believed in. So, but I mean, the main question is, is will we get this under control or what do you think is gonna happen? So the interesting thing is that I don't think that the role of science is actually to do prediction in this context. Mm -hmm. And I don't engage in prediction in that way. What all I do is I say, we have a choice. We can choose to eliminate this virus. And from the beginning, from early on, I said, we had the choice to prevent it from arriving places. And once it arrived, we had the choice to eliminate it. And I've always said that we are four to six weeks away from eliminating this virus. It's just, the question is only when do we start? So the point is that it's not that long. If we all decided, if Sweden decided and made a concerted effort to eliminate the virus, Sweden could get rid of it in a matter of weeks. It's a question of choice. And as Sweden goes into a summer where as usual, people will go and basically self isolate for much of the summer, the opportunity to achieve elimination is present. It's really a matter of choice. So we can all get there. The world can get there. India, if you look at India with its billion, 1.4 billion people has just achieved a reduction in cases by a factor of five. How were they able to do it? They did the right things. Vaccination was not a major factor. It's a small factor, but it was the lockdowns. It was the strict, travel restrictions, it's the green zone strategy that enabled it to happen. Again, with vaccination, we can add vaccination, we can do it easier, make it easier. We cannot make it much shorter because it only takes a few weeks if we do it all out. The question is not, can we do it by 2023, 20, whatever it is year? The question is, will we decide to do it? And if we decide to do it, we can do it now. Yeah, well, I mean, I, the only thing that I speculate on with predicting is that the, the evolution, if you look at evolution and variants, if we don't decide to do it, we are worrying about the Delta Indian mutant now. We will worry about new ones in the future. That's right. And someone asked, someone asked up above, I, maybe I should have kept that name in mind, uh, but what, uh, it, what do you think that this, 
if we let it keep going here, what is, uh, Eric's, er, uh, Yanni Erickson, I think, says it backwards. Uh, do you think that, how high do you think it, the risk is to develop another hybrid here in Sweden? Is there going to be a Swedish mutant? I hope not. Well, so um, every place in the world has a chance of getting its own mutant, um, unfortunately. Uh, to, where the only thing that prevents getting new mutants is, is, is not having cases not having new cases. So where there are no new cases, there still isn't an Australian variant or a New Zealand variant and, and China hasn't produced new variants because they have no cases there in terms of community transmission, basically almost none at all. But what we need to realize is that there are people who speculate against, this is scientific speculation, that maybe the variants won't get much worse. Maybe the virus has limited its abilities, but you know, we know how bad SARS was. And SARS is a similar virus. And I don't see any reason not to believe that we can't mutate quite far away from where we are. And in that case, we can have much more severe variants. And, um, uh, you know, every time people say, well, I don't think we're going to get something more severe, something more severe happens. So um, uh, let's not count on good fortune, wishful thinking, or speculation. Uh, the bottom line is um, the only way out of this is to stop it. And the, the advantage of stopping it is not just that we get rid of these variants, but we'll prevent the new variants that would happen from happening. Yeah, I, I spent 20 year, or two years of my life, more or less uh, part-time, about 20 years ago, fighting a battle with creationists on evolution and and uh microevolution is is very is is something that's it's not that hard to understand really uh but it's it's viral evolution is random and it's dependent on the number of replications and uh and but you have to understand i mean you talk about evolutionary pressure and people like to say oh a virus won't if it kills the host it won't keep going but this virus spreads pre-symptomatically Killing the host doesn't matter. It's already spread. That's right. And the only evolutionary pressure is for it to avoid vaccines. That's Keep right. that in mind. The only evolutionary pressure is for it to avoid vaccines. And to and, spread and more rapidly more, in this case. Yeah. And to spread more rapidly. And what that usually does is by viral load. And viral load usually means it's more dangerous. That's right. Okay? If and we've up. seen that. And, and the fact that, the, seen that. The, the new variants are more rapidly spreading and more severe and, you know, vaccine evading. The vaccine evading is easy yeah. because it's just a question of difference from the original virus. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so there's a there's a few questions uh, from a couple of different people on on. Look, uh, singing together, orchestra together. Marianne Ritloft asks about singing together. How long until they? Whether this is going to be relevant, uh, and and uh, what, what do you what do you think? I mean, do you think the people should go back and start playing together, or is there a safe way to do this? Well, so first of all, people can sing together in in a football stadium where each person is apart by about 10 meters, if they, if they want to do that, maybe that would be, you know, I mean, the, the point is the following. Um, we can do everything that we want that's consistent with a previous quote, normal life, if we achieve elimination. Yeah. People, can, people can do this even in their village I mean, if everyone quarantined themselves for two weeks, you could get together and have a concert and sing together and all of those things. It's really a question of being determined to achieve elimination, to stop transmission. And again, all it takes, if you did it all out, is actually two weeks in a village. Yeah. And so why aren't we doing this? And the answer yeah. is the only reason we're not doing this is because we keep telling ourselves we can't. Yeah. Now, we did a video with you last June, a year ago, and you said on that video, I recall it very distinctly, that we need to protect ourselves. We need to go into our own villages and just stay isolated and protect ourselves while the infection rages around us. 
And but your your, your point is very good. I mean, because it's exactly what you said about India too. You take a, if you want to have your orchestra, you want to have your choir, isolate within your village for two weeks, and then you're safe, and then you go forward. Okay, that's, that's right. That's, I mean, what did they do when they had, you know, the so the the, uh, the uh, Australian Open or the news, you know, the whatever? People came in, they quarantined for two weeks, and then they partied. Yeah. You can do that and anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world, you can do a two-week quarantine. I mean, you think about it. It used to be that we thought about this as a huge amount of time, but we've been doing this for a year and a half. Two weeks is like nothing anymore. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, Peter Nielsen asks, he said earlier, you said a country could get virus-free in weeks. Is that still possible? Yes. I think that's what you're saying. Yeah. That's it. The virus dynamic hasn't changed. It's it's the fact that we're all tangled in knots with thinking about, you know, problems that are not the relevant problem. Next. Yeah. And which are, are there? I, I, I know you'll love this question. Okay. Andrea Aikland asks, are there any good comparative studies on the economic effects of countries that have gone on the, on the zero COVID line compared to those that have only tried to limit the virus? Yes. And there's a very good one by Cecile Philippe of France. Yep. Um, and uh, uh, we, we let me, uh, if people want links to those papers, so look up Cecile Philippe. There's also a Lancet article that includes multiple economists on it. And uh, they basically say the same thing. They did a slightly different analysis. Those are relatively recent analyses. And, and there's just a report, I just tweeted it today. So if you go to my Twitter feed, I saw it. my yeah. Twitter is Yanir Baryam. Um, I'm sure that uh, you can find it if, uh, um, and it's, uh, I just have this tweet 10 hours ago. It says zero COVID for the best economic performance and Zoe Hyde uh, uh, is posting about the Australian Bureau of Statistics and Australia's economy. So we have these comparative studies. There is no doubt. It's, it's not even close, right? Because what happens is that what they did is they, at the beginning, they shut down, they stopped the virus, and then they've opened up. And for a year, they've been basically at normal in terms of economic activity. Their economies are doing very well. And the rest of the world is, is, is like um, you're walking around with I don't know, a trap stuck on their leg, causing bleeding and, 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 and hobbling, hobbling around. Um, I just heard this news and, and normally I'm, I'm not political. I just, I just wanna point this out, right? The G7 is talking about, you know, taking China to task or something like that. I don't remember exactly what the story is, but here China is, their economy is booming, it's growing you know, I don't remember exactly what percentage, but it may be close to 10% this year and, and, and not at all suffering from the pandemic. And you have the Western world with this trap uh, causing bleeding and limping around. And, and here the Western world is saying, we're going, you know, the Western powers are saying, we're going to take China to task. It's, it's almost laughable. Okay, I haven't seen this yet. I'll have to look, okay, okay, wow. I did see your tweet that earlier today, and I, I already retweeted it, and uh, and I put it in the chat, so hopefully somebody will pick up on this. It's a really another good one. I, there's a lot of good economic things. There was a study that came out of MIT uh, looking at past pandemics, particularly the Spanish flu in, across the United States, showing exactly what you're saying, and it was it, the first paper on it came out in March 26th in 2020. Yeah. And uh, and but it was been ignored. Uh, but the, okay. So uh, here's, there's me... one more uh, reference that I can give you. I mean the the article by Cecile Philippe, which I really recommend to everyone. It's hosted on the COVID Action Group. So this website is covidactiongroup.net. Uh, if you go to the scientific guidance, yep. there's an economic analysis, uh, and it's it's very clear. Uh, the point is that it, it's not subtle. It's it's not a subtle effect. It's a huge effect. And so it, you know, we were pointing to it before it happened because you can do the theoretical analysis. It's pretty straightforward. You invest on a short time basis, a few weeks, you achieve elimination, 
And then you're at normal. You have these short, what they call snap lockdowns that take a few days and stop any localized outbreaks due to imported cases. And otherwise you're at, at, at standard economic activities with limitations of, of, of uh, international travel. And it's, it's so much better, so much more effective economically and again, part of the bizarre thing about it is that you have all these countries that are you know, more dependent on tourism, but you have the countries that are less dependent on tourism, they could go to elimination once they would be elimination, then the tourism countries would also want to go to elimination because it would be their benefit because then they would be able to receive all the people from the other countries that did elimination. So Europe-wide, uh, we we have a paper that analyzes the economic benefits. We have a couple of papers on this, but the recent papers are just looking at the data. A year later, it's just obvious. Uh, and so, let's see. Uh, that's a really uh, I, you sort of answered this question, but Eliza Bastiani, who runs the Barn and School, the Children and Schools uh, Facebook page here. It has asked, at, at a global level, what pressure is there to introduce a zero COVID strategy in the countries? Who supports zero COVID and, and in what way? And Brigitte Hellman Magnuson also asked, which countries have adopted a zero COVID strategy? I mean, you've sort of covered a lot of this, but yeah. maybe you can just summarize. Yeah, so, so first of all, uh, so we have many teams around the world that are working on advocating for elimination many countries of Europe and many other places, Latin America and, and the US and Canada, and also of course uh, in, in India and, and in uh, other countries around the world. Um, so there is advocacy and we're now building a larger network of, uh, of teams to advocate globally. And there are particular groups that are working on European wide efforts. And one of them is, is an organization called Human a Patient. Uh, and they're uh, working at the EU level. Uh, and we would like to foster that activity uh, to, um, to create a European Union level impetus for elimination. Uh, so, so we're working on it. Um, uh, welcome everyone who would like to participate in it. Um, if you uh, uh, if you would like, if you're not yet involved, or if you would like to increase your involvement or do something different, uh, feel free to email me. Uh, my email is my first name, Yanir at necsi.edu. NECSI are the initials of my institute, the New England Complex Systems Institute. You can look me up online. My email is publicly available. Feel free to email me. Um, and you can also connect to me and to the network through the endcoronavirus.org network. There is a join us button. And, and you can also send to uh, uh, Vetkov that you would like to participate. We're all joining together uh, in this effort to, uh, to move countries, mm -hmm. continents, uh, and the world towards elimination. And in terms of the countries that have already adopted this policy, um, again, China, Australia, New Zealand, there are other countries. We have recently had outbreaks in Taiwan and Thailand and, uh, and in Vietnam. Uh, we were hoping that they were more secure, but the new variants have challenged those places and with introductions uh, through the quarantines. Uh, on incoming arrival. There are now outbreaks there. We're hopeful that they like uh, the countries that have been uh, successful in Australia and New Zealand in stopping such outbreaks. They will be successful as well. Um, uh, the other place is there are subnational regions. And again, Atlantic Canada is a standout area. It sits as a unique area in the Americas. There are other countries that have done much better than than others, but Atlantic Canada really has adopted an elimination strategy. It's four provinces of Canada on the Eastern side of Canada, um, and they've done a remarkable job. And of course, there are countries in Europe that are doing or have done better. There are islands like the Island of Man and other countries, other islands that have done uh, elimination. And, and bottom line is islands have it easier. 
but it doesn't mean that other places can't do it. And there are plenty of places, and, and, and honestly, we've had this conversation before, Sweden of many countries has tremendous advantages for achieving elimination. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, uh, bottom line, it's a question of decision. It's almost certain with our culture because we have an outdoor isolation summer culture here for nearly sure. three months or two and a half months. And this is what helped us last year. Uh, and it's and people see that and they think it's going to just go away. But I think this, if we're all listening to you here carefully, we realize we should take advantage of this. And as fall comes in, make sure we do something to eliminate. And one of the questions we started to go in about schools before, I would say ventilation, filters, and masks, okay, at least uh, bubbles, a lot of other things. But we need to eliminate it first. We need to get it, keep That's it down. Right. And if it's down, then we can go for it. And if you think school children can't wear a mask, my daughter, just nine, was eight when she started. She went the entire year this year. She just finished school on Friday every single day with a mask on, okay? There are special custom masks that I had made, so they have filters in them, very good masks. Every single day she wore a mask. The teacher just said it was unbelievable, and she did so well. She actually started a trend, a number of other kids, because I got designed masks. A number of other kids started wearing masks towards the end of the year. Still very small numbers overall, but it was kind of interesting. Yeah. So it can be done. I have two questions left, because we're a little over here, and uh, and I and there. One of them is a lot of people have asked, okay, but, but uh, <clears throat> Erica Johansson asked a question, and, and she says, what, what would you do in our clothes, okay, if you were in our clothes, if you were here? And she's talking about network, uh, working from home, teleworking. Her husband is apparently now going back uh, to work because her, 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 their, his company decided they'll come back because he's received the second dose of vaccine now. Uh, so there, she's trying to figure out and 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 wondering what 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 would you recommend to people like you recommended a year ago, uh, at, as the fall comes back, especially for company in, in August when we go back. I mean, we need to eliminate, and so that's a clear part of this. But if we go down, I mean, what do you recommend to tell people? The main thing that there is no doubt is that. Becoming sick with this disease can have very, very bad consequences. And, and it's irreversible. If you get sick, you've yeah. gotten sick. You can't decide afterwards that you want to take back something that you did before. Yeah. So the main thing is to take the best precautions possible against becoming infected. And that still means isolating oneself from others, where one has to be near others wearing masks, um, in addition to, you know, wearing a mask, wearing the best possible mask, um, in addition to the KN95 type masks, there are um, uh, uh, powered uh, masks that have a HEPA purifier that pumps air into the mask. Um, uh, and again, you know, even a mask, it's better to wear goggles with the mask to prevent getting it into your eyes. Um, uh, and one should be careful also about food. Food is, it's known that the disease can start with gastrointestinal in, uh, um, symptoms, presumably because of contaminated food that's eaten. Um, and, and so taking all of these precautions is a tremendous burden. But, you know, the bottom line is opting out as much as possible from the risk taking that is being done I hope, and we should all hope, that within a short amount of time, surely, I hope not years, and hopefully months, the main question that we face is, can we get past this time without getting infected? So there are times where the risks are lower, when cases are down, um, uh, when um, you know the warm weather is uh, doing also a decontamination of things that are outside. Um, but as we have risk, uh, we should take uh, precautions. Uh, we have put guidelines on our website about day-to-day -day activities. Bottom line, it hasn't changed that much. The reduction by vaccination is a factor of 10. And you know that if you had a chance of breaking your neck 
um, and you reduce that chance by a factor of 10, you probably still wouldn't do that. Whatever it was, was the activity that was being reduced by a factor of 10. So this whole narrative about the fact that vaccines lead to be not necessary for people to take precautions is not correct. What we use vaccines for is reducing the likelihood of transmission, which by reducing the number of cases, reducing the transmission, that's what reduces the risk. So the main number is not whether we have a factor of 10 reduction in transmission of, for an individual, but whether we have the reduction by a factor of 10 or 100 or 1,000 or the number of cases in the community. And that's what prevents the risk of being infected. Very nice way to summarize it. Thank you. And now the last question, and this is, I left a loaded question for the end. Okay. <laughs> this is Tobias Peters Peterson, probably how you pronounce it here. Uh, many countries have condemned, have been condemned in the UN in resolutions for their alleged or real crimes against humanity. As a Swede, I feel so powerless during the pandemic, during this pandemic, and I feel the world has been too polite against our government. Why do you think that Sweden has not been condemned in the UN for its way of mistreating and misleading its population and jeopardizing the lives of its citizens during this pandemic? Can and should the UN condemn Sweden for how it has treated us during the pandemic? And I want to also add not just jeopardizing our lives, but our, our health, it's, as you've pointed out. I mean, it's not just our lives. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Somehow I had a feeling that was going to be your answer. Okay. Yes. Thank I mean, you. The, yeah. the, the real challenge has been the perspective of society, the perspective of systems that this is not preventable. Yeah. This is totally preventable. And yeah. the fact that there are decisions that are being made to abdicate responsibility to prevent, even to foster harm, by allowing disease to transmit in the population, even when it could be prevented, is just not okay. No. And, and, and the accountability for that has not happened. I do think that there should be an outcry. I think that there should be a, 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 um, a big cry in anger and outrage against the decisions that have been made. I would like to see the decision makers held accountable for their decisions, which we know from experience in the world were not unavoidable. The opposite is the harm was avoidable yeah. and they should be held accountable for what they did. Well, with that, I think I will sum up. I apologize to anyone who I didn't get your question. I tried to sum up questions and, and include your names wherever I could, and I might have missed one or two. Uh, <clears throat> I also want to advertise a little bit. There's, I think it's only online, but Vetkov will have a response to the people who wrote against our article about children and the dangers to children with vet with uh, COVID, although the real reasons we were writing were one to point out that there were dangers to children, as Yanir has very nicely, eloquently pointed out. And uh, also to point out that we should prepare for the fall, because in the autumn, as Yanir also pointed out, the children are going to take the brunt of this if most of, many of us are vaccinated, assuming we don't have variants that escape the vaccines anyway. And the, the variants seem to be affecting the children more now and, as well. So, but I mean, it should be online at Doggins Nehefter if you want to read it. I mean, it's a response. One one physician argued that our references weren't good enough to show that there was long COVID with children, basically is the argument, which is it's kind false. of interesting. And the other was a group of 33 pediatricians who argued that the death count of 13 was, was inaccurately uh, put forward because uh, and argued that some of them probably died with COVID rather than of COVID, which is, again, false if you look at it. Even a child with leukemia almost always survives, and yet a child with leukemia is very high risk with COVID. And, uh, and so with that, uh, I think, Yanir, I want to thank you very much for your, uh, for your presentation and your just answering questions, and so, as, as usual, so eloquent uh, explanations of everything. 
uh, and uh, and I'm happy to keep working with you in whatever ways you can, as you we talked about before the meeting, uh, before the yeah. session. So, uh, thank you very much, Yanir. Thank you. And uh, as as with always, I wish you all the best. Let us make it happen together. <laughs>